Hello, this is Stephanie J. Block, and you are listening to Broadway Podcast Network. Hi, I'm Lara Benanti, and you're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. Hi, this is Alex Brightman, and I play Beetlejuice in Beetlejuice the Musical, the Musical, the Musical, and you're listening to Broadway Podcast Network. Hi, I'm Norm Lewis, and you're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. Welcome, listeners, to As the Curtain Rises. Bobby Kearns and Kay Fields are partners in work and in life. After years of shows that lasted around three weeks but received rave reviews, go figure, they're almost ready with their next masterpiece. But first, a few things are going to put a damper on their spirits. Can Bobby and Kay pull this off? Will Cheryl and Steve survive one another till opening night? Will James Cameron find out an Avatar musical is in the works? Will the Hellinger rise again? As the curtain raises. D- rises. As the curtain rises. Dun, dun, dun. Welcome to Deep Dive Broadway. Tonight, we go behind the curtain to celebrate the incredible cast of As the Curtain Rises, the first ever Broadway soap opera, which you can find on the Broadway Podcast Network. I'm Dory Berenstein, and I couldn't be more excited to chat with these incredible and very dramatic artists. I really adore them all so much. Tonight's event celebrates and supports the Actors Fund. The Actors Fund is a national human service organization that has helped so many throughout the entertainment industry for so long. Since March 2020, the Actors Fund has distributed over $18 million in emergency financial assistance to over 15,000 performing arts and entertainment workers in need due to the COVID-19 pandemic. You can learn more about the tremendous work of the Actors Fund, and you can support their heroic efforts by going to actorsfund.org. And now, as the curtain rises, let's start by taking a look at some interview clips with our uh, first superstar guests, composer Bobby Kearns, writer of the Avatar musical, also known as the amazing Michael Urey. Renowned, and she may not be here yet, but I'm going to introduce her clip. Renowned Broadway producer Cheryl Phillips, brought to Very Stylish Life by Lilius White. And finally, our narrator, who has an opinion about everything and then some, the intoxicating Alex Brightman. <laughs> Well, we're working with Steve Jones again, and I guess pigs are flying. I had no intention of this ever happening. I thought that the last cigar was the last cigar, um, but we don't have a choice. We're stuck with him. He's getting us an amazing star, just like he did with Nathan Lane on the last cigar, but this time, this time we don't even know what this show's about. I don't even know. I've never even seen the movie. Um, but he's got the money. He's got a theater. He's got me by the balls. It's going to be awful. It's going to ruin our careers. I've got no inspiration. Kay is dry as a bone. It's just going to be nothing but misery but maybe we'll win another time well what you just said was a bunch of nonsense but what I'd like to talk to you about is my love of nachos the perfect combination of crunchy gooey salty spicy sweet I think not Cheese shredded atop a mountain of tortilla chips. Tomatoes sprinkling down like manna from heaven. Guacamole. One big glob that nobody gets a chance to have except one lucky person. Next question. A 
oh, well, it wasn't a problem for me. But it, uh, it was quite funny to see people come with their livestock. They did bring chickens. They brought all sorts of rocks. And, um, and there was even someone who brought a miniature schnauzer and uh, dressed it up in blue and thought that they could use that as uh, some kind of capital to get into the theater. Uh, but we are going to uh, put an end to all of that. We're going to make sure that people know in advance not to bring their chickens or their dogs or their rocks. That was so funny. I have to know how do you find your characters. How did you, you know, reach inside and find the character of the narrator, the composer? How did you guys do that? You know Michael? That. <laughs> <laughs> it's all on the page, Dory. Um <laughs> I actually, I mean, actually, that's that's a joke, but it is true that the script is so fun. It was, I mean, and, and the characters are so stupid. Just like <laughs> watching these improvs, you can, you know, like they, they're all, so, it feels like it's like Broadway, but with fools or morons. You know, it's like Broadway with morons. And it was just so delicious. I, I immediately, uh, I feel like immediately um, at home in the words and, and, you know, and I got to do all my stuff with Ashley Park, who's a really good friend, and uh, and so we were able to actually record together. So a lot of it, I feel like, came out of our chemistry with each other, and um, just like so fun and so just so dumb and and delightful. I like that you think that I had to come up with anything. You were like, just have a bunch of opinions on things. I was like, okay, but what's the character? I was, I was like, okay, sure. And then they're like, but also lower your voice. I was like, done. That's the character. Bunch of opinions. <laughs> it's really, really sort of kind of where I found it was that the minute I was allowed to play, we played. And then, like, you know, we kind of got, as we went, more and more comfortable with just sort of reading what was there and then doing a second pass, which was just sort of me, Mystery Science Theater 3000-ing it um, and just sort of seeing where that went and then leaving it up to the the kind and and uh you know sharpshooter like hands of you guys to edit it like you know i think editing is also where you can either make or break a comedy i think and because we couldn't do this together it is in the editing to sort of make the pace what it is so i'm thrilled that we all came out smelling like roses because we sure didn't have to <laughs> well um shout out to bart fassbender uh and and marty mcguire on the sound <clears throat> side sound design side and and uh, Britt Bigelow and uh, Alan Seals on on the the tech side because yeah it really is masterful uh, and, and, you, and you and you on the writing side <laughs> and, and, you... and Mark yes I I um you know it's it's been uh, the first time we all got together we were very ambitious you know we hadn't really done this before and we had the entire cast on the call at the same time thinking that we'd be <laughs> able to you know just read the script all together <laughs> that was a disaster. That, <laughs> but uh, but, uh, but it, that should be that should be released as extra footage. Everyone just sort of terrible. sitting there like. <laughs> well, there were so many Wi-Fi problems, and yeah. you know, so many freezes. So many people who would be in the middle of a. <laughs> In the middle, and this is a few months, you know, this is like a little while ago. We were still all getting used to this. Now I feel like we're all pros at oh, yeah, Zoom and StreamYard and. You know. Absolutely. I think that like, you know, now I sit down and like a mic appears and I have a thing. like now it's just like feels like I like a Pee Wee Herman in the beginning of that movie. I have like a Rube Goldberg machine for everything I do. Because <laughs> I've so, had time. So Alex, I know you have to you are in a starring role on uh television tonight, and everybody has to right after this go to Law and Order uh to see or Alex tomorrow. And you can watch it streaming watch tomorrow, tomorrow if you want to pay. I don't want to I don't want to cut people out of this thing if there's people to be seen. So you can also watch it tomorrow or DVR it and watch it and take 30 minutes after it's on and miss and skip all the commercials. You know what I'm saying? Well before you go um and and Michael eager to know this. So we, where we left off um but because we've we've released eight episodes far and you guys don't know what the next four episodes uh are gonna be you know it's very 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 
dramatic. And, biting my nails. Um, I literally, quite yeah. literally biting my nails. So, but I'm curious to know, because we left everybody hanging with, you know, a lot of drama. Do you, do you have any hopes for your characters? I mean, does the narrator want to star, you know, are you working on another musical? Um, only because I, only because I have to go, I would like to answer this first, but um, I do think uh, like anybody, you know, like in any sort of dramatic sort of piece, I just hope the narrator finds love in or out of the show. <laughs> Um, and I hope that when and if there is a sequel, um, we can sort of dip back into sort of his more domestic life with whoever he ends up with. Um, and I'm not claiming to know what, what he likes uh, or doesn't like just yet because I think he's open to interpretation. Um, and so I think he can find the sexual silver lining in just about everybody. And so I think that, you know, stay tuned and uh, stay open and stay loose, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, thank you so much. I know you have to run. We don't want to keep you, but uh, I always think about if what if those were my last words, and I would really regret if that was really like if just a meteor happened. Stay loose, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> the worst thing. No, uh, please, everybody. You know, everybody, please, when you can, donate to the the, the all all these wonderful charities and stuff like that. That's the the best thing you can do during this time. So thanks for listening. Uh, thanks for dealing with my big booming, uh, not really booming voice. Um, and I hope to see you all in the next four episodes. Thank you. Michael, don't go anywhere. <laughs> Bye, Alex. Bye, Alex. Uh, happy to stay. Uh, I, I, uh, so what do you think is going to happen for Bobby Kearns? He, he is wow. uh, just in a, in a quagmire. He is in deep. <laughs> he has uh, he has to come up with a musical. He's now working with his ex uh, husband and current wife. Uh, and I'm I mean it's it's really a thrilling for me because I've always wanted to play a bisexual. But what I'm hoping for in the final four episodes is one more husband and one more wife. Mm. And I feel like then it gets out of the uh, the the love triangle and into the love. Uh, hexagon? Wait, no, what's five? <laughs> p p p polygon? P poly yes, yes, we'll take that. I don't know. I, uh, I Andrew, Andrew Barth Feldman will probably have the right term for that. Um, whatever well, it is. Pentagon, I, there it is Pentagon, in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Pentagon, I want to love Pentagon, Dory. Okay, well, it, you know, it's not too late. We can, we can write something in for you, I think, you know, also, absolutely. Have, have, what about a sex scene? Um, okay. Just throwing it out there in audio, uh, you know, like a, like a, like a, you know, it just, just the sounds of 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 romance and love, and and I think that I think that I it's think an we're ready. inspired idea. It's an inspired idea, and it would work with your character. You have so many different directions to go. <laughs> yeah, I absolutely. So. I I think we'll we'll look look for that. Why don't you stay here and let's bring on two of your co-stars. But before we do, let's look at their clips, if we may. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about who's next. And if you, are you okay to stick around? Yeah. Okay, great. I'm not on SBU tonight. Uh, not tonight. Coming soon. <laughs> so stop. Uh, she's in everyone's business and is always the first to know the Broadway disher also known as the divine Leslie Margarita, and our avatar science consultant, Andrew Barth Feldman, played by none other than the magnificent Andrew Barth Feldman. Let's take a look. I just, I'm mostly consulting on making sure that the stage looks like a real place. So um, I just did some work on a, a jagged little pill. Uh, my good friend Antonio Cipriano, I had to make sure he looked like a real person. Uh, he usually does not. And then, uh, you know, th that sort of thing. And then there's the new um, Star Wars musical that's opening. Uh, I'm ensuring that each of the planets has its roots in a real planet while staying true to the planet that it is in Star Wars. So there's lots of projects like this where I have to merge fiction with reality. And, and that is uh, one of my favorite things to do. So yes, I'm, 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 I'm very busy, uh, but I, if you have any more projects to throw my way, uh, please, I'm, I'm absolutely all ears.
Am I still hoping for a role in hashtag avatar? Um, you know, honestly, I feel like they've burned that, that tree with me. Um, would I take the lead? Yes. Yes, I would. After some like careful consideration. Um, I won't, I don't do blue. So that is um, something that we'd have to discuss in my contract. Um, it's just something that I feel very strongly about. Um, that, you know, I, I, other people are, are happy sharing themselves as, as a blue person. I just, it doesn't look good on me. I would maybe um, go for like a pink to stand out a little bit, like a special Navi. But again, things that can be dealt with um, later on with my contract. But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, they would have to really kind of amp up my role. Um, and, you know, when they, when they escorted me out of the audition, I mean, when I, when I, when I um, left the audition, um, I remember turning to them and I think they saw me because I know that the security guard was in front of me, but I know that they saw me say, you're going to regret this. You're going to regret this with everything you have. And I know as I was leaving, I heard, I heard one of them say, I never want to see her again. And I knew in that moment what that meant. They were going to add me into this cast in some way. I knew it. I knew it because everything is opposite in this business. Everything is opposite. So the fact that they said they never wanted to see my face again means that my face will be on the posters. <laughs> You're a freaking genius. Oh my God. <laughs> you know, one of the, what, the what are you doing? Stop talking. <laughs> one of the best things about this whole experience um, behind the curtain for me is like keeping Broadway alive. And and I'm really um, am so grateful to all of you because it really feels like it's still going on. And in fact, yeah. I have this musical I'm working on, and I swear I almost called you, Andrew, to say, could you help us out? Could you be our science <laughs> consultant? <laughs> Listen, I'm happy oh. to fake it the same way I did in that interview. I'm more than happy to just continue to to, to make things up all the time. I bought it. I, I totally bought it. You're in deep, Dory. You're in real deep. Totally. <laughs> oh, yeah. All, all in. Living all in. Yeah. How many yeah. hours of interview footage do you have of Leslie? Oh. Yeah, that's that's the spin-off. Let me tell you, that's gonna be a whole other season that we're gonna be doing. It's amazing. <laughs> it was hard to choose the clip. Very hard to choose the clip. I mean, well, Leslie, don't you don't you think there should be a Broadway disher? I mean, there are so many of them already online, but yes. <laughs> I do think that there should be a Broadway Disher series. I think she's got a lot to say. And it really is just a good way for me to diss people in character. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And you're and you're fighting for a role in the show, which may or may not happen oh, yeah. in the next four episodes. I think she Stay I think she'll absolutely be in a featured role. Mm. Whether that's backstage, I don't know. <laughs> featured <laughs> in the audience. Featured audience member. <laughs> absolutely. For the interactive featured. portion of the show. Yeah, featured usher. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you how do you all find the the process of creating an audio drama as opposed to live performance? I'm curious to know how you find the the whole process. Well, it's easier. It's definitely easier because we can do things a bunch and our faces don't matter. And we just, you know, it's it's nice in that way. Um, but it's really, f I mean, I have a very easy job because I'm just playing basically myself with my regular name and everything. So my job's really easy. I'm just having same. a good time. <laughs> and same. Yeah, I'm really just playing myself. <laughs> <laughs> And and Michael, you and Ashley, you know, after after the debacle uh, of that first uh, attempt, very ambitious, you know, yeah. um, 
you continue to record at least with with Ashley, and so you have the repartee. But you guys have been doing it solo, and so you're you're re, you're doing your lines, and you know if there are other people that are chiming in, you don't you don't have that back and forth. It's pretty well, easy. I mean, I, you know, my stuff is so done like tweets anyway, so I don't really have to interact with people, which is what I prefer anyway in real life. <laughs> I'm kind of just on my own. And for people me, Dor prefer. Dory, you're an excellent scene partner, I was going to say. So uh, <laughs> you, we have a great time, you and me, when, when I have to do my stuff. So I'm doing just fine. <laughs> Yeah, it's so fun, you know, for, for you know having a, a, a Ashley. But it, it's also fun. It's also fun to imagine the physicality of it. I mean, uh, it's a little dorky, I guess. But like in a scene where people are in a room together, it's fun to uh, sort of, especially like if there's, if there's like any kind of conflict, yeah. to imagine uh, any uh, physical struggle or uh, physicality, whisper. You know, it, what that's yeah. what I love about an audio drama is, is like you have to put all of the situational conflict in vo the voice, uh, whether it's, you know, like changing the way you speak to certain characters at different times or, or uh, any kind of uh, uh, public versus private moment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and especially those big scenes with like the rehearsals or the, uh, the, the big presentation, there's so much great like side talk and, um, and I love that in an audio drama. I love and I love a sound effect and uh, and I, I I love the highs and the lows. It's it's really intimate, you know. It's it's just so immersive because it's in your ears and you. I I just I just get ca so caught up in audio dramas, but I mean I'm curious to know also like being in different roles than you typically are in, uh, having to do with Broadway, like being a composer or being a science consultant or, sure. or you know, <laughs> dishing about Broadway. I mean, are you, are you seeing <laughs> the world of Broadway through a different lens and has that informed your future? Yeah, <laughs> yes. I, I don't think it's, yeah, I mean, when we, like in the last couple of episodes, there are a lot of like marketing meetings that I'm part of and lots of meetings about the production that I'm like, this is great. I'd love to just sit around when people are having these discussions and being like, let's make it yellow instead of blue. And I'm like, awesome. You know, like that kind of thing I think is so fun. Um, and isn't, you know, I, that's usually not the conversation is let's make it yellow instead of blue or let's have like stilt walkers in Times Square. But like, it's fun for now in the podcast. I'm having a great time. I guess, you know, Dory, I'm, I'm curious. I've never really made a musical before. Is this what it's like? Is this what it's like? <laughs> oh, exactly. Is really, this is, it, how accurate is this show? <laughs> you know, you were talking earlier just about how they're crazy. And then I'm sitting there thinking to myself, you know, we were really inspired. A lot of colleagues. <laughs> no, totally. When I listen to it, I'm like, I wonder if that's... <laughs> It, no, I, I, I'd i say oh, yeah. an exaggerated version of... Yeah, because I, 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 I remember when you were describing characters, there were certain ones that were like blank type, and I was like, got it. But like, <laughs> with me, it's, I'm, I don't have to worry about anything, because I'm just me, regular. I'm, I, I, this is great. <laughs> you are playing you, which is... I am indeed. You know, do you, do you have a lot of, you know, what is your process to get into that zone so you can be you? I think getting out is harder. I think I, I, <laughs> I leave the recording session. I don't know which one I am. Um, no, I, I don't know. It's it's fun. I've been explaining it to people as like, so here's the list of people and they're all playing these hilarious characters. And then I come in and I'm playing regular myself. And I'm the only <laughs> one, which is so hilarious. Um, no, I don't know. I, I, it's, it's, it's extraordinarily easy and so much fun to, to, like I, I think uh, Alex Boniello, who I do everything all the time with, he when I were talking about it and he listened to a bit of it, and he was like, "Whoever wrote this gets why you the whole thing that you are is funny." And I was like, <laughs> "Yeah, I think that's true." So so it's very it's very easy um, to to slip into the the silliness of my whole deal, I guess. Well, <clears throat> I I can't wait to find out what happens for all of you next. Um, Leslie, Andrew, if you want to stick around a little bit, and Michael, 
thank you um because we have to we have to squeeze people out to squeeze people in to bring in uh some other members of our cast i know oh. um <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> um but um uh, thank you for well, being thank a fabulous you. composer i'm very excited Hi, about what's Hi, ahead great to see you well, great to see bye -bye, you guys Michael. so i have a little intro for our next group uh all right. Awesome. Great. Joining us in a moment um, is my wonderful partner in time as far as writing is concerned, Mark uh, Pikert, our very fabulous but disruptive book writer, Thomas, brought to Scheming Life by Mauricio Martinez, our CAA receptionist and triple threat by Alana Levine, the legendary lighting designer, Natasha Katz, played by the legendary Natasha Katz. And finally, <laughs> Randolph, our Sardis maitre d', our Lyft driver, and our Starbucks barista, all played by the extremely versatile Jake Smith. We got everybody? All right. Hey. 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 Hi, everyone. <laughs> and there, Mark uh, and I have had so much fun uh, uh, playing with your lives. Uh, we, we really had a blast. But um, Mauricio uh, uh, is a real nemesis to poor Bobby, um, A, our composer lyricist team. And, uh, you know, have you enjoyed stepping in the shoes of a, a Broadway book writer? Oh, yeah, it's fun. I get to be on the other side and, and be. Uh be shady and, and villainous and it's always that's always fun you know uh and it's yeah definitely fun i'm, I'm having a lot of uh laughs uh in the, in yeah. the session i i just love how it's written well uh and alana you are an agent but you have a whole backstory that that uh you know, you're a triple threat but you are working at caa i think i added I a name love playing a receptionist anytime I can. I always think of those 1940s movies where like they're putting the plug into all of the little like, what do you call them? Like those old switchboards where they kind of put the things in and out. And I literally, even though C-A-A-A-A-A-A-A -A 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 -A, mm -hmm. um, is an incredibly present day agency in my mind, I am putting the little things into <laughs> And connecting everyone like I'm like his gal Friday. Like that's actually what I was imagining in my mind. I hope that came through. I think you nailed it. I think you nailed it. Um, and when we were not, uh, you know, oh my God, we need another character here. We need another character there. And it was so convenient to just turn to Jake and, and, and he did them all. He did, you know, <laughs> let's say hello to Randolph for a moment. Oh, hello, everyone. <laughs> our Sardis maitre d'. He's also our Lyft driver. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Like, good to hear your voices. <laughs> then he's also our barista. Wait, <laughs> how many shots did you want in that one, bro? <laughs> so it certainly made it easier. And, and then, you know, we were looking for an incredible lighting designer because obviously Avatar the Musical has got to be lit beautifully, right? And, you know, we searched high and low and then we found the most amazing lighting designer, a uh, person to play a lighting designer who happens also to be <laughs> an, the most extraordinary lighting designer, Natasha, make her uh, audio drama debut. Thank you, Dory. This, that, this is my audio drama debut. And it's been a gas, that's for sure. I tell you, I, um, you know, I've always had so much respect for actors. And I've spent my life trying to make actors look as beautiful as I possibly can. But my respect has gone through the roof. I don't know how any of you do it. I don't know how you do it. So hats off to all of you. Well, now, you know, you did you uh, adopt some kind of creative process for yourself to get ready to do your scenes? Oh, well, I actually, I did find it hard to play a different Natasha, a different version of myself. Or, well, yeah, oh, well, I guess it lurks underneath somewhere, that Natasha. 
Yeah. Well, you, you were amazing. Mark, you, you've, you've particularly, um, you've given voice to a lot of the people on this, <laughs> on this screen right now. I, and it's been so much fun to work with you. Do you, <laughs> do you want to share some of your thoughts on the whole process? Uh, well, much like Leslie, this is just a chance for me to drag people into the guise of comedy. Uh, so, uh, Dory, that's where you've been very helpful because I will write the most outrageous thing and you'll read it and go, I love this. What if we did this instead? And I'm like, you're right, you're right. We don't actually need to say that person by name. We don't. <laughs> we're, we're a good team in that way, I have to say. <laughs> That's true. true. Um, <laughs> so what about Avatar? Do you think it, it would could really be a Broadway musical? Should we just go do this? What do you think? I feel like we've proved it. We've proved it. We've proved totally. it. Oh, yeah. Why not? Yeah. But of course, poor Natasha can't actually work with the color blue after all the work you went to, to you know, with your blue color uh, demos and that. Yeah, I'm dying to do a musical with uh, that's bl black light and orange light. That is uh, high on my list now. <laughs> <laughs> Natasha came prepared when we recorded with her. That's I love that. It's, it's, it's so yeah. I love that. It was amazing. Yeah. And then she also was she was able to switch the 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 light in case we wanted a different hue. A different well, wow. I have writing designer will travel. I I have a Mary Poppins bag at all times. Wow. Um, whenever <laughs> an actor needs just a little things. pink or a little <laughs> orange and black, I'm there for you. We we had a lot of fun with cameos, uh, and we continue to have fun with cameos because we're not done with the series yet. And and so we've we Lynn Nottage and Alex Lacamoire and Gordon Cox and. Uh, um, oh my gosh, uh, Matt Britton and uh, uh, who am I for my goodness? We, we've had incredible um, uh, guests that have been themselves. Um, and it's been so much uh, to work with all of them. And they're acting, you know, these are not people who are typically behind the mic in that way, you know? And uh, it's, been, it's been really interesting to see them uh, maybe be a little nervous about performing in that way. And so I think, you know, particularly we've had a lot of press <laughs> do cameos and, and, uh, and maybe they'll, they'll, you know, think about that next time they're writing an article because it's hard, right? It's, yeah. you, it's I like that. Yeah. Like Can I just interrupt to thank Mark and Dory on behalf of the entire cast and you have during a time where uh, it's, it's really hard to find work because there are just limited possibilities right now. Not only have you written something that is actually fantastic and bringing so much joy to the listeners, you've heard tonight how much everyone has had such a great time doing it, but it really means a tremendous amount to all of us in this community that you wrote such a huge piece that gave so many people an opportunity to do the thing that we love, which is act at home with no makeup. Um, and, and audio is a, an actor's dream. Um, yeah. But truly, like, it's an incredible thing that you guys did. You made a great piece of art, and then you gave us all a chance to do what we love during a time where there are just limited opportunities. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I agree, I agree. Well, um, thank you guys. I. I you know, and Mark, please, and I, you know, just the opportunity to work with all of you guys and during this time has been the the light, you know, really just can't wait till we can all be in the room together. Well, you know, that's what I am counting down until I can see the, all of you on stage and, and Natasha see your extraordinary work, you know, that I can't wait for. Um, but um, we have we have another segment to go, and I thank you all so much for for being part of as the curtain thank rises. You. Stay tuned. There are uh, our final four episodes um, are very dramatic, so I'm very excited uh, to <laughs> share them uh, with you all very very soon and with everybody who's who's listening. 
So thank, thank you. you so thank much. you guys. Bye everyone. Bye. 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 So um, we have a final uh, segment uh, that I'd love to tell you about. Um, uh, this is about uh, our, our personal, our very humble personal trainer who turns Broadway upside down with his incredible talent, Stavros, who is brought to life uh, by the amazing Ramin Karamalu and our killer mega Broadway impresario, Steve Jones, also known as Broadway impresario, James Monroe Eigelhart. Let's take a look at their character clips. Well, I'm embarrassed to admit it. I've never seen the film. But I can I obviously know how big the big biggest box office hit I'm, I, I believe. Um, but I think uh, now is probably not the time to watch it because I'm like a sponge as well and I don't want to emulate and maybe take on preconceived ideas and I don't want to narrow my f field of creativity. So at this point, no one has also forced me to watch it. I know em Emmy's been trying to get me to do it, but I think at this point, I'd like to see it till we're up and running and maybe then watch the film. So I'm embarrassed to say, and I hope that doesn't go against me, but I've never seen the film. I don't have a soft side. I, I, I don't see a side for soft sides. That's that, that, like, again, again, people, okay, let me say something. People in this business, especially Broadway, they get this family atmosphere crap. And they're like, we're a family, we're a family on Broadway. It's not, we're not a family, we're not a family. It's show business, that's, that's what this is. This is about taking art and finding a way to manipulate it to make money. That's what we do. If we didn't, why in God's name would people pay $500 to see a girl who's green when the show's been on for what, 30 years? They still pay $500? But this is show business, ladies and gentlemen. That's what this is. Look, mostly everything that has happened in America, a black man has done it first, right? Okay, so look at Scott Rudin. Who does Scott follow? Me. Thomas Schumacher, who did he follow? Me. The brother did it first, and then the rest of these boys came out and decided to be all hard ass. Now, you know, we got Jeffrey Sellers out there being the hardest with Hamilton. I was a hard first, okay? I am the one. I'm the one who suggested we do E.T. the musical. I'm the one who suggested that. That joke, that wonderful, amazing joke that Mel put in his show, put theater in the round in the square. Where do you think he got it from? Me. I. Me. I am. I am just to be in the presence of mega producer Steve Jones and, Hello. and Stavros, the new blockbuster star of Broadway. It's an honor. Both of you have so seamlessly stepped into the shoes of your character. Um, and in, in a shocking way, uh, James, Steve Jones just seems like, you know, your alter ego. Um, <laughs> And and you know the as as terrifying and on, ominous as he is, it's just been for you. It's like I got this guy right off the bat. And and uh, Ramin Stavros, it's it's seamless. It's Ramin Stav. Who am I talking to? I don't know. Let's be honest. I don't know because um, I think both of them are winging it. Let's be fair. Yeah, <laughs> honestly. It, it it always amazes me as an actor when I'm when I meet producers and there's a there's this uh, there's this uh, kind of look that all the producers know exactly what they're doing. That's why they're producers. They're in charge. And then when you get bit bigger in the business or more known in the business, you start your producers become friends. You go, oh my god, they have no idea what's going on, just like me. And so you have to bring this bravado. It's like going to an audition. You have to bring this bravado with you to let people think that you know what you're doing. And people are like, well, he looks like it. Sure, sure, go ahead, give it to him. So I kind of think that's how some producers are. And Steve just, he believes his own hype. That's the fun thing about him. He, I've met a couple producers like Steve 
where they've like done a lot of big name shows. So after like the first two, the five could flop, but those first two are still still riding on them because they're still on Broadway. So yeah, th these guys they're just totally believing their own hype, you know. <laughs> so not not to name names, but you you've been inspired by people you've worked with, perhaps. Yeah, in the past. yeah. There, there, there's those party conversations. There's those party conversations where an actor walks in. I know Ramin knows this. Ramin, you walk into a place and you meet um, producers, quote unquote, and then they just start talking to you. Like, oh my God, oh, James, so nice to meet you. Listen, man, saw you in this show. You were great. Listen, I'm a producer myself. Got a little show off Broadway. And they start going to you and you're like, I was trying to get to the hors d'oeuvres. I don't know why we're still talking. Yeah. What is happening? <laughs> so Steve is that dude. <laughs> well, you had the great insight to cast Stavros. Yes. Uh, you know, when he walked into the audition room, it's like the world stopped and, and, and Stavros entered and it changed everything. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, that now that is a real thing. There are moments in life where you're in an audition because I have been on the other side of the table at times. You're on the other side of the table and you've just seen audition after audition. And it's not like these people aren't talented, but you're just looking for it. You're looking for something. And then that person walks in and they look flustered and blood. They don't even there to be for the audition. And then they, then they do something and you go, that's it. That, that, oh my God, fight. Run after that person and get, get them back in here. And then they sing and they, you realize, oh my God, they're so talented. And you find it. I mean, there have been so many moments uh, where Broadway has found a person like that. Yes. Or that person that other people see as just an ensemble member. And you see them do something in the ensemble. You go, why are they in the ensemble? They should be out front. I'm watching them the whole show. And next thing you know, bam, that's the person. So a, a situation like Stavros, that's that's a real life situation. Stuff like that happens. <laughs> yeah, and, and for Ramin, for you, you know, the, the, the line between Ramin and Stavros is, is like this, because I'm sure that's happened to you a million times walking into that audition room and just, you know, leaving, not that it hasn't happened to you, James, but, you know, that that it just you've blown people away. So you were you were really created the character of Stavros looking at your own life, perhaps. I have to be honest. Um, I think I was playing Stavros in a way that I wish my career went that way and was a bit uh, uh, that seamless because for the longest time, I was kind of known as uh, Ramin two times because I had to keep going back because I'd get to the final and the producer would be like, I like him, but something's not right. I swear, maybe in my first four jobs, and ironically, they were all for Cameron, or three of them were for Cameron Macintosh. I'm like, but I've just done other shows for you. How am I still coming back? You don't know what I'm doing. But I, I, I get flustered at auditions, and it's always at that crux, at when you get to the final. Up until there, I play it cool. Yeah, I don't want it, whatever. And then you get to the, in front of the table, you're like, oh, I really got to get this job. I got to feed my kids. <laughs> and, I, yeah. and I flustered up. And you become too green and too, uh, I don't know, not untrustworthy in the wrong sense, but just like, can he, this guy hold it together when we give him the, the big part? So I always had to go back a second time to kind of like, show me once again, you, you'll you be all right, right? So but I, I, people had to go on the limb for it. I'm, I'm with Ramina. There's only been one audition for me that was like that. The others have, I've always had to go in again and go in again. There's only one, actually the fun thing is only, it was it was Aladdin. Aladdin was the only one where I walked in and they went, yeah, that's him. And I think that's only because I walked in with a, forgive me, I, I walked in with a, I don't give up attitude. I was like, you're either gonna love me or hate me. So I'm gonna go in here and have fun for me. And then I'm out. I'm out of here. I literally was just there just to show Alan Menken I could sing because I jacked up an audition so badly before with him. I was like, I, I cracked so bad. I'm like, so this audition, I just want to show the man I can sing and I'm out. And next thing I know, my agent calls because you got it. I'm like, huh, that's amazing. Whenever I go in, I'm usually like Ramin. I'm like, I really want this. Oh, I got I got a house to pay for. Got got rent, to, got things to do. And I'm like, I'm just I just come in too, too needy and <laughs> they can feel it. But that sense of contentment is a wonderful thing. And yeah. it's always it's always a it's like when you do a workshop and then you get the role off that, yeah. it seems seamless because you weren't auditioning, you were creating, you're having fun. Well, yes. why can't we always do that, you know? So, well, and I think that's what happened with Stavros. He had, there was something so calm and naive about him. He wasn't there 
for that reason initially. So when you're thrust into it and you, you don't have time to think, oh, I'll give it a shot. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be fine. Yeah. And then you're relaxed. You have nothing to lose. My favorite moment recording with you, Ramin, <laughs> was when we had to do a little, a little song uh, that – uh, you were auditioning for and and you you it was a bluesy version of the song um, that uh, you you did and you just nailed it of course immediately and then then you said but this was not in the script you said you know how about I do a, a fantasy version of it <laughs> and then and then you just like like the roof blew off and it was just like yeah let's do that <laughs> what made the cut made the cut the no, I had to use both of them. How was I supposed to decide? Are you kidding me? Oh. It, it, just even the line, you know. <laughs> really? How about I try a phantomy version? That was just so perfect. So we have both in there. It just was so good. Yeah. And James, you have per perfected the closet recording yeah. process. Yes, people all um, over are looking to you to learn from you the, it's it's called necessity it's like what what i need to record someplace and this office wasn't free because i had my kids were sleeping in here so i was in my uh master bedroom closet which is really really tight as you see in, in the clips and i have all foam stuff all on the wall and clothes behind me and i literally can i have this much far to move so it's like all my energy must be put into the mic there's no place else to go so that's and the funny thing is i've done a bunch of cartoons over the past since uh, during 2000 during the pandemic a bunch of cartoons in that room because it, everything was so focused i couldn't think of anything else so i it, it was it was a, at first it was a curse and became a wonderful blessing now i'm in here for my podcast show i do a podcast show with marvel comics uh but once uh, once i'm done tomorrow i go right back into the closet because that's that's where i can concentrate now <laughs> well you always sound great <laughs> thank you very much uh both of you uh, when you're not stavros and producer steve jones you're you're killing it you know, and, uh, for during COVID, you both are so prolific and accomplished. Uh, it's kind of unbelievable. I'm curious to know, though, in recording shows like this, when you have to dive into the script and you don't have, you're not working opposite an actor as you typically would be when we're not in the middle of a global pandemic. What is that like? How do you how do you become Stavros and and Steve Jones when when you know you're reading opposite me as opposed to a real person. <laughs> well, I think it's that taking that leap of faith is putting trust in you and knowing how our schedules to coordinate our time difference was a, a, a tight window. It's just taking that leap of faith, having fun, not self editing, not worrying, uh, uh, listening to yourself, and. For me personally, was judging by your reaction. So getting that great feedback instantly, I thought, okay, well, I guess we're on the right path because you know the show inside out. I was new to the game and new to the series. So leap of faith. And if you're happy, I'm happy. And we just keep rolling it from there and just see what, what snowballs after that. He's right. That's pretty much what it is. I mean, the great thing is what people what people don't know is Dory is actually a wonderful producer, but she's also a fun fun voice director. Uh, you you know the story and you know what you want, and so when we bring things to it, and also you let us be silly, you let us kind of just be as big as we want, and then you kind of bring us down if we're too big. Uh, so it's really it's it's a fun thing of just just letting go and just having a good time because this is all with your voice. So you have to tell a story in a certain way. So I just kind of, I, I do like Ramin does. I watch your vibe and if you dig it, I'm like, okay, cool. I'm in the right, I'm in the right space. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I couldn't adore working with you both more. I just um, love it and thank you so much. And I am um, pretty much obsessed with Stavros and Steve Jones and just like, <laughs> I want the series to go on forever cause I don't want to let go of these guys. So thank you very much. Thank you both. Thank you both. Thanks for having me. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, for our final very important guest. I am just thrilled to be able to welcome uh, Cheryl Phillips, an a very important Broadway producer who is brought to life by the amazing, incredible Lilius White. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Can you see me? Okay. You look fabulous. You, oh. look like, you look like a very important producer. You really I am, do. I am. I am. Yes. I have my jewelry on. 
have all you my know, jewelry and, and, and you know, and I'm ready, ready for my close up. Clearly, clearly. <laughs> I, I'm curious to know because you know, you just stepped into Cheryl Phillips shoes. Like you had been producing Broadway shows as, as kind of a diva producer for, for decades. You just like, I, I want to partner with you on things. I'm just totally sold. How is that from observing the world of Broadway forever and all and, and the people around you? I think it's from, um, from having to be the boss in, in real life you know, a lot of the times and make the important decisions and get the stuff done. Um, uh, I'm uh, the eldest of three. I have two younger brothers and my brother under me is 11 months younger than me. And uh, I have my other, my young, my little brother, I call him my little brother, but you know, he's a few years younger and I've had to be the big sister and be the boss and write the checks and cash the checks and pay the bills. And I was a single parent for a, a long time. And so I've had to be the boss. And so Cheryl taking, uh, taking charge of the shows and calling the shots and getting the stuff done feels very natural to me. Uh, but here you are partnered with uh, your, your nemesis uh, or someone who is not so easy to work with, uh, Steve Jones. Uh, played so beautifully by James Monroe Eigelhart. And, uh, but you two are navigating together how to get Avatar on its feet. Yes, yes, we are. And Steve Jones is my nemesis because he thinks he knows everything. And, um, and I'm here to show him and tell him that he does not. So- um, You do. I, I, yeah, and I do, and I love it. <laughs> so- you you've been very busy during this whole uh, terrible uh, pandemic, very prolific. And and how do you you know, you have become quite proficient at, at uh, audio recordings and all of that. How do you like uh, doing these kind of vo voice recordings? Um, I, I know it doesn't I, replace live, but I, I absolutely, absolutely positively love doing this. Um, it it uh, gives me a chance to be somebody else. And I've done some voiceover work. I, I haven't done, in my estimation, not nearly enough. I am the voice of the lead muse in Disney's animated Hercules. And I got to do that with some fantastic women and with Alan Menken and uh, um, Howard, Howard, Harold Wheeler, um, uh, David Zippel's words. Um, and I just, I, I enjoy it a lot because it's, it seems easy to me to do. Um, and I think that the people get to listen and, uh, and kind of figure out their own image of what the person is who's behind that voice. And I, I just, I love that. I like doing it. So what do you think uh, is the future for Cheryl Phillips? What's going to happen to her? in the going forward? Well, Cheryl Phillips is going to produce not only Avatar, but she's producing a wonderful comedy on Broadway. And I can't tell you the name of it just yet because I don't want to spill the beans, but Cheryl is going to be, a, that show is going to be a huge hit. It's a comedy. It's going to be something that we all need right now, a little levity. And um, she's going to have a, several boyfriends that she talks about in the series, she's not going to show you them <laughs> because they are quite a bit her junior and she doesn't want the young people in the theater to get the wrong idea, you know? So um, Cheryl's going to have these love affairs and be giddy some days and some days she's gonna be dreadfully disappointed, um, but she's going to produce and she's going to produce a, a comedy. She's going to produce Avatar um, and she's going to venture maybe into some television producing as well. Wow, Cheryl is a model, absolutely. I am <laughs> admire her so much and she stands up to, to Steve Jones and yeah. that, that means a lot. Um, Lilius, uh, it is 
always incredible and a dream to work with you. Uh, adore uh, it's, you it's, so it's much. my dream. We have so much fun and I really love you so much. And, and we just have such fun together. Yes. And so <laughs> I, I'm looking forward to, to this being a huge success and, and, uh, and us doing more and more of them until maybe it does become a TV something. Or maybe other. Avatar becomes real and, and we are, are producing Avatar, you know? Why not? But what I did do, I went back last week and I watched Avatar. It's long as hell. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Not to have to watch the whole thing. I'm going to have to go back and see that last part. Right. But um, it's a lovely love story it as is. well as everything else. It is. And that always appeals to me. Well, a good choice for you to be producing this show on Broadway. Well, I can't. I can't wait to see what happens with you in the next four episodes. <laughs> I am ready. I'm ready. Um, and and um, I'm, I'm very thankful to be here. It's, it's a lot of fun. Well, thank you so much. I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, just look forward to recording you in the very future, our, our next round of episodes. But uh, okay. adore you. Thank you for doing this. And... Uh, see you very soon. And I'm going to just thank also um, the incredible cast that joined us tonight, as well as uh, all the other cast members from As the Curtain Rises uh, that were not on tonight's show. But um, uh, they're amazing and just a dream uh, to collaborate with. And I also uh, am eager on behalf of everyone to thank again our design team, sound design team, Bart Fassbender and Marty McGuire. And thank you to our incredible BPN team that worked so hard on this series. Uh, Alan Seals, AKA Alan Walrus, Brittany Bigelow, Joanna Nikolova, Katie Rosen, Cindy Schatz, Bo Westby, and our incredible executive producer, Liz Armstrong. Uh, please remember, if you can, to donate to the Actors Fund. Their Herculean efforts right now are just uh, amazing and we you know we need to support them in every way we possibly can uh please also check out the broadway podcast network at bpn.fm uh, there are over a hundred spectacular theater related podcasts musicals plays and this soap opera as the curtain rises thank you for joining us tonight uh, please stay safe Show business people love talking about one thing, show business. We can't shut the f up about it. How's rehearsal going? How's the show going? What's your next project? It's like, okay, we get it. Showbiz is rad, but how about what was the weirdest thing about you as a child? Or if you could have a threesome with two Pokemon, who would they be? You know, real questions. Have you ever wondered what Broadway's Amber Ardolino's nickname was in high school? Or if Tony nominees Alex Brightman and Lily Cooper played in a band? Or would rising star Colton Ryan know the best public restroom in New York City? I bet you don't know how much money is in Mark Summers' bank account. Well, guess what? I ask all these questions and more on my new podcast, Now We're Talking, with me, Drew Gasparini. Tune in each week for a new amazing guest from the worlds of Broadway, TV, film, and beyond. Don't be crazy. Subscribe right the hell now. Now We're Talking is partnered with the Broadway Podcast Network.